Hey, what's going on, everyone? Renee back here with another press conference from New York Film Festival, this time for the movie Maestro. Maestro is the upcoming film directed by Bradley Cooper and starring Bradley Cooper as Leonard Bernstein, the famed composer, conductor, which basically tells the story of his rise in prominence and tells the story of the meeting between him and his wife, Felicia, and kind of the dy dynamic behind that relationship and the chemistry and the marriage as a whole. What was cool about this press conference is that it took place the morning after they actually had the premiere night at New York Film Festival, which took place in Geffen Hall, which is the famed musical hall there in Lincoln Center, where Leonard Bernstein himself performed multiple times. Unfortunately, because of the SAG after strikes, Bradley Cooper could not appear as part of this press conference, but he was in attendance the prior night at that special screening, which was perfectly okay and was approved by SAG-AFTRA for him just to show up as an audience member watching the film screen there for the first time. However, what I will say is really cool about this press conference is that it included Jamie Bernstein, the daughter of Lenny and uh, Felicia, someone who actually plays a kind of significant role later on in the movie and is portrayed by Maya Hawke in the film. You get to hear about how she worked very closely with Bradley and, and the rest of the crew there in order to make sure that the accuracies and everything was taken into account for this portrayal of the family. What was also cool was to see Josh Singer, who is the co-writer uh, for this movie, uh, who wrote the film along with Bradley. And it was great for him to show up because this also took place just a day or two after the WGA was able to strike a deal with the AMTP pretty much to end the writer's strike. So it was nice for him to show up, but he wasn't scheduled to be there, but it was nice for him to join in on the press conference. So I hope you enjoyed the full press conference here. Again, uh, it took place after our press screening of the film, which was fantastic. And later on in the channel, I will be able to sit down and do my full review of the movie and my thoughts on the film itself. But I present to you the full press conference uncut with all the press questions and Q&A included. So I hope you enjoy all of that. I also included subtitles because as I mentioned in previous uh, videos, for whatever reason, the sound is not great here in the Walter Reed Theater where these press conferences are taking place. And the microphones don't seem to pick up really great. I you know, decided, let me just go ahead and put in subtitles so that it's easier to understand what everyone is saying. So I hope you find that a little extra benefit there while watching this video. Make sure you comment and let me know what your favorite moment of the press conference was. Is Maestro a movie that you're looking forward to watching? Let us know in the comments below as well. And of course, if you enjoy what you saw and you want to see more of this stuff and maybe help the algorithm out in making this video, get this video recommended to other like-minded folks like you and I, all you got to do is make sure you hit that like button. I'll be uploading more stuff and more coverage from New York Film Festival. So if you want to see more of that, and want to stay up to date with all of that stuff, all you got to do is make sure you're subscribed and make sure you have that notification bell turned on so you get notified every time a new video is posted. Last but not least, got to try to pay the bills here. And I want to talk about some of the partners that we have with us here. One particular partner in mind is Surfshark. You want to find a better way to enjoy and unlock the streaming services that you already subscribe to. Surfshark may be a great solution for that for you. So happy to have Surfshark on board as one of the affiliate partners for the Low Key Geek channel here. If you're in the market for a new VPN, I highly recommend a company like Surfshark. And trust me, I've tried all of the VPNs out there and by far Surfshark is the number one clear cut winner for me because of many reasons. Yes, of course, it gives you great protection and security protection while you're browsing the internet, especially when you travel and you're in other countries or other states and you want to make sure your browsing data is, you know, fully secured and no one is like spying in on you or stealing some of your stuff that you're transmitting online. What I mainly use Surfshark for is for unlocking the streaming services that I already pay for. There's no better feeling in knowing that you can get more out of your streaming services by accessing content that is not necessarily readily available for for you in your region. What do I mean by that? Well, a great example is that recently I wanted to check out some movies off of Hulu, but I don't subscribe to Hulu. But I found out that in the UK, 
Hulu movies are shown on Disney Plus. So all I had to do was connect to the UK server there through Surfshark. And then once I was connected, I just logged into Disney Plus and bam, Hulu movies were available and I was able to enjoy it without any issues with quality due to speed because everything was playing perfectly and the audio was coming in crisp and all that. It's as if I was just watching it normally through my normal internet connection. But the main reason why Surfshark is by far the best is because it is the cheapest out there. And I can't stress that enough where, you know, we're all trying to save money here. And with all the stuff that we pay for on a monthly basis, the last thing we need is to add on an additional high monthly payment to our bills and Surfshark will not hurt your wallet at all. As a matter of fact, if you scan that QR code you see on the screen right now or you check out the link in the description of this video, you'll find out how you can get Surfshark for 85% off plus two additional months for free free. Again, I can't speak highly enough about it and I'm so glad I came across him and I'm so glad that they decided to partner up with us here. So again, if you are in the market for a VPN or maybe now you're more interested more so now to check them out for the first time, scan the QR code you see on the screen right now or check out the link in the description and find out how you can get 85% off plus two months for free. Again, thank you so much. And if you do try Surfshark out, let me know what you thought about him when you do and let me know your thoughts about the service in the comments of this video. So thanks again goes to Surfshark for partnering with us. And this is just another great way to show your support for the channel because every time you sign up for one of these partners or you check out the merch shop or whatever the case is, you buy something for yourself or for a loved one, the proceeds help to help grow this channel and support this channel so that I can continue doing things like this, attend more film festivals and attend more Q and A's and press conferences to bring to all of you out there for your viewing and listening pleasures. So so all the support you throw our way here is greatly appreciated. All right, without further ado, enjoy the Maestro New York Film Festival press conference. Thanks for watching. Thanks, guys. Uh, I'm Justin Chang. I'm a member of the Festival Selection Committee, and I have the great honor of moderating this press conference for this remarkable movie. So I'll go ahead and bring everyone up. Please join me in welcoming Josh Singer, the co-writer. Jamie Bernstein, uh, daughter of Alicia, and Christy McCosco Krieger, producer, Kazuhiro, makeup artist, Mark Bridges, costume designer. Kevin Thompson, production designer. Steve Morrow, production sound mixer. And uh, maestro Yannick Nese Seguin. Before I begin, I just want to acknowledge um, how pleased we are that uh, Josh could be with us. Um, the writer's right over. And, uh, stage. and I want to acknowledge how odd I know it must be to be speaking about the film uh, with Bradley Cooper and Carrie Mulligan, uh, among others, not present, but I know their uh, amazing contributions will be discussed uh, by all of you and, and your own as well. So thank you all for being here. Um, I want to start at the beginning. I know this has been a long gestating project with a lot of moving pieces and I'm going to try to piece this puzzle together as best I can. Please bear with me and I apologize if I go out of order, but I'll start with you, Josh. Um, I know that you came on, to write, came on board to write this film nine years ago, I believe. So what brought you into this and can you talk about uh, your collaboration with um, co-writing with Bradley? Yeah, so uh, first of all, I, I want to take just a second and thank David Goodman and Chris Kaiser and the WGA Negotiating Committee that I think bravely led us uh, over the last five months into you know, a necessary and, and great agreement that uh, you know, will protect writers uh, for a long time. Uh, and I want to thank the AMPTP for making a deal so I can sit here. So, uh, uh, you know, so nine years ago, Fred Berner and Amy Journey, uh, who were the original producers on the project, uh, approached me uh, to tell the story about, you know, Leonard Bernstein, um, 
uh, Marty Scorsese at that moment was attached to direct. Um, and as a you know, nice Jewish boy who grew up singing in synagogue choir, um, and uh, so had a, a real uh, love of music, and specifically music with some uh, uh, some Judaism laced through as, I, as much of what his music was. Um, I was attracted to the project, and I spent uh, two or three years sort of wandering in the desert, uh, doing research, talking to the family a little bit. They introduced me to some wonderful people like Alfred Bigel and and Shirley Gavis uh, and Helen Adler, folks who had known many. Um, and I I gleaned what I could, and I put together a script that uh, managed to uh, attract Christie and Stevens' attention. Uh, I'd worked with them on the post. Um, and then managed to attract Bradley's attention through Christine's theme, which Christy can talk about at more length. Um, and then, you know, and then I heard words that no screenwriter wants to hear, which is, you know, page one, page one rewrite. Um, and, you know, the script was clearly going to be shelved because Bradley wanted to go in a different direction. And normally in those situations, the writer is shelved as well. Um, but fortunately, whatever. The movie gods, you know, smiled upon me, uh, and Bradley asked if I would join him in this adventure, as I had already done a bit of research, and I was thrilled. Um, now, when you have Bradley Cooper joining your movie as a writer, you don't know what to expect, because he's a great actor and a great director, but, you know, is he going to get into the muck? And I shortly found out that not only was he going to get into the muck, but he was going to go so deep that I was going to struggle to keep up, which is not something I'm used to doing. Um, you know, Bradley read everything I had read and more. Bradley wanted to talk to everyone I had talked to and more. Bradley watched all the video there was. There's this book, uh, John Gruen's book, about uh, the family, which, you know, he, he spent three months with you guys in Italy in 1968 or 69, 1967. Uh, and that book became a touchstone, in part because the book was this really wonderful insight into the family, which was Bradley's clear focus, but also had these wonderful audio tapes of Gruen talking to all of you guys, which Bradley listened to ad nauseum. I mean, so much so that he used to be able to write stuff, and I'd be like, oh, which book did you get that from? And he'd be like, no, no, I just wrote that. Because he literally could channel Lenny in that way. That's how deep he went. So it was really... Um, Bradley was a lightning. <laughs> and Christy, from your perspective, you had, you know, worked with, with, with Josh on the post, as he said, and you also, of course, produced West Side Story with Stephen, so that Red Star connection obviously there. But what was it like from your perspective of also navigating these moving parts and bringing Bradley aboard and, everything, and realizing he was the best person to direct it? Well, we brought him aboard first to Star. and. When it became clear that Stephen wasn't going to direct it, Bradley said, hey, I just made this movie called The Star is Born. It hadn't come out yet. It was April of the year when it came out. And he said, would you be willing to come watch it? And if you like it, maybe I could throw my hat in the ring to direct the film. And so Josh, Stephen, Kit Kat, John, and I all went to watch the film. And 20 minutes in, Stephen leaned over to Bradley. He's like, you for directing this movie. Mm -hmm. I think he said an explicative that I won't. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so we signed him on to direct and star. And then it actually just really, we, we got the blessing of the family. Virginia, do you want to talk about that at all? Uh, eventually, but eventually. Okay, right. Fine. So we got the blessing of the family. And then we were sort of off to the races. Um, Bradley goes deep, as Josh was saying, research. He, he went to every department head, and he really worked closely with every department head. It was all in the prep work for him. We worked for three and a half years honing everything, getting it right, getting the makeup right with Cosby, working with Mark Bridges, identifying the right costumes, working with Kevin, figuring out the right sets, the sets we were building, the locations we were going to. We wanted to go to the hallowed grounds of where when Alicia lived, and so we went to Carnegie Hall, we went to Tanglewood, we went to Ely Cathedral. We really, he, he, he was like, this movie has got to be authentic, and we're not making the movie unless we're prepared to make it. So for me, it was like kind of easy to like get on board with that man who was so passionate about everything he was doing. He showed me what he was doing. We did screen tests. We did we did film tests on hair and makeup, and and we just we really like went to great lengths to prep the film. So when we got there, it was kind of easy. 
Jamie, I will come to you next. Um, I know that there's been a shortage of interest in making um, a Birdsign movie over the years. What was it about the script and this, this creative team that allowed you and your, um, your family to realize that trust them not only with your father's story, but also, as we can see, this is equally your mother's story as well? Right, well that, I will tell you, was Bradley's own idea. And uh, the, the original uh, notion of this project when it was first uh, thought up 15 years ago was that it would be more of a conventional biopic kind of a uh, film. And then uh, when Bradley suggested that his approach would be different, that he pr preferred to make it an exploration of Lenny and Felicia, like more of a portrait of a marriage, my brother and sister and I were so impressed and pleased with that idea and that angle, that lens through which to tell the story that, that we, from the very beginning of Bradley's arrival on the project, we felt like we were in really good and unusually good hands. Well, it shows very much in the, in the final results. So I am up, let's keep going right down. Um, Kazu, I know that of all, our, all the artists on stage, um, I know everyone must have spent their time with Bradley, but I imagine you spent maybe the most with him, <laughs> just the hours of application and everything. But can you talk about that? And I wonder if you could talk especially about um, just the process of aging him. I mean, we, the movie starts with him, you know, in, to, toward the end of his life, and then we, you know, it, talk about just um, all the, the decisions that you made in going into that. All the decisions? Uh, okay. I mean, especially like old stage, or? Yes, yeah, okay. particularly, yeah. Uh, so, you know, like, the, actually, for me, Lenny was that oldest stage when I saw him on TV and, uh, when I was young. And uh, uh, I was really inspired by him. And I loved his look because such an iconic person and, uh, with a passion for the music and a love for the music. And it shows through. And so uh, at that time, like 35 years ago, uh, I really thought, like, oh, I want to work on a film about him and finally came to And so I love his look. So at first, the first, the first test makeup we did with Bradley was uh, middle stage, like middle age and old, old stage. And so because that's kind of the hardest and uh, middle stage is the most acute in film. So it was important part. And so and the old, old age is very difficult because uh, when people get older, what happened is not a body on the surface, it's more like a kind of string from inside. And that's the uh, age of what happens. So for the only thing we can do is adding on the surface. So we have to figure out what would be the best way to convincingly make Bradley look like Lenny and about at the same time getting him older. So uh, that was the point. And, uh, uh, we went through a lot of tests, and the first one was uh, just an uh, internal test, I call like a uh, my work, workshop. Then we went to a Disney concert hall, and after conducting, and we tried like uh, five different stages on the two days. It was kind of a crazy. <laughs> he said, I told Bradley, like, we don't do that usually, <laughs> you know, because it's one, one look yeah. a day, you know. And so, uh, and the oldest look took the longest because there's a more element to add on to it. And we made a body suit, you know, he had a really big gut. And so we had to add, and it was a practice changes. And also, arm had to be aged, and there was a hair punched in. And earlobes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was so impressed by how perfectly yeah. you were able to recreate my father's ears. Uh, and he, had big, you know, <laughs> he had a big, big ear, too. <laughs> so we had to uh, put it They were very good, very big in and inside. And out. <laughs> and so I put a plastic piece to stick out the brother's ear too. And then we made a, a nose plug because he wanted to talk. <coughs> he wanted to talk like a lady. It sounded like a lady. And so the first thing he asked me, can you make a nose plug to change my voice? And so uh, I made a nose plug with a different size of holes. So kind of uh, give him a, more like a, a nasal voice. 
you know. And so as he gets oh, old, you, you put it inside? Inside, yes, inside. yeah, he, he had it all the time. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> uh, of course, you know, like, uh, let me see notes was wider than brackets. So I, I made it wider at the same time, so change it nose shape and the voice too. And I made it like several different stages because uh, as he get older, voice changed. But he figured out how to change his voice with just using a one time or whatever. So stuff. Then that goes in and we, you know, like a, the board cap and the uh, forehead cheek, cheeks and nose and lips and everything, the neck. And the that stage <coughs> took about five hours. And usually like a call time is like a one o'clock. <laughs> AM. You know, AM. 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 We got to set at seven and he was Leonard Bernstein. Yeah, and so because he wanted to appear as Lenny on set when the crew call happened. And so usually, you know, makeup, uh, makeup artists, we have more time to spend until the, the film is, you know, filming is ready, but we have to finish it because he has to direct the film. Yeah, so, yeah. That was it's like 1 a.m. and six hours. And then, you know, sorry, it's not going to be long day. Mark, um, your costumes at Maestro are remarkable in also capturing this progression over many decades, um, but Thank also you. because um, you know, you, having two characters who were very, very beautiful, very stylish people at all these different eras, I mean, what were some of the challenges and the pleasures of dressing Lenny and Felicia throughout um, the course of the, the, the story? You know, uh, we're always trying to tell a story. We had to do 40 year passage of time the ups and downs of their lives, the different social circles that they ran in. Um, so figuring that out, we had a lot of visual references with a, a well-documented life, but um, you know, you, you, there's where the imagination comes or you find an amazing piece that you could go off of for each period. And um, you know, I worked very closely with Bradley. Bradley was tireless in coming to fittings. He'd give me three hours on Tuesday and then three hours on Wednesday and three hours on Thursday. You know, he was dedicated to coming to those fittings. And we really worked very hard. He mentioned it last night. Do, do you remember how much we worked on those costumes? And I was like, I sure do. <laughs> uh, and he was, he was tireless in that respect. And, and Carrie was a real joy to, because her acting process is such you know, I'm kind of giving an outside shell to their inner life, and so it was incredibly exciting to work with an actress like Carrie and figure these things out. And also, when I do research, you know, I'll look at, there's a great uh, biography about Leonard and, and uh, of course, Jamie's book, famous Father, Girl, and, you know, you're reading this and, and taking flights of imagination, but also reading between the lines on what this is and what it could be in terms of clothes and telling a story. You mentioned, of course, there's such a rich photo record for, for inspiration. Were there any particularly distinctive signature outfits or touches that you were like especially pleased to incorporate? You know, one of our favorites is um, a, a costume that is uh, was taken in 1976, I think, uh, and it's a small period of Leonard's life where he had a beard, and we see him make his announcement of artists must pursue whatever they need to do. And uh, it was really striking. It's a, the striped shirt with the neckerchief, and it was perfect for that moment because it, it echoed what he was saying verbally, so it was visually. And uh, that's a color photograph, and, you know, it's perfect for that moment in the film, so why not use it? And Bradley uh, jokingly called it his Pirates of Penzance costume. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we really got a kick out of that, and I, I think it's, it's that meeting of research and appropriateness for the script and appropriateness for a director and an actor all happening at one time, and that, that's one of our favorite costumes. Kevin, uh, two of the film's most important locations, of course, are uh, the Bernstein families, uh, their Upper West Side um, 
apartment, which had to be recreated, I understand, and their Connecticut home, which you were fortunately able, the film was able, was able to shoot at. Um, to film at the actual country yes, house. Exactly. And they're both, they're both so seamlessly um, done, but they're very, two very different challenges. Can you just speak about the decisions that went into restoring that sense of place to both? You know, I think they're, the intimacy of their domestic life was really critical to get into the background of what their characters were like and what kind of people they hung out with. And, but also their private life in the country and how that intersected with the other. Um, Bernstein's opened up their country house that was filled with memorabilia, scrapbooks. We could get into a, amazing research that, and Felicia's paintings and things on the walls and snapshots around that led us to understand the, the depth of their relationship and what kind of life they had and from the, the games they played on the shelves and things like that. And um, that led to an understanding of how to detail their life in the city with the activities that went on in that in the, in the city, and especially the legendary Dakota apartment that you mentioned, that we were lucky enough to get into the actual real apartment so we could scale, duplicate moldings, get the feeling right, and then um, uh, add the layers of all the things that sort of represented their their style and their lifestyle with their with the parties and the Thanksgiving dinner and things like that. So I think, you know, you get technical stuff done of, of the periods, but you always, Bradley was always like, come back to the center of understanding what is the emotional story that we're telling? Always go back to that as a touchstone. What is this scene saying? And that was always the non-tangible thing that you tried to in, inject into the design as you were going. Um, in the earlier part of the film, I'm struck by um, the incredible kind of formal playfulness of the sets in, in that first half in black and white. And just when we see his bedroom uh, with this curtain that looks like a theater curtain, almost, and then bleeding into the hallway and then morphing into the, the balcony of the Car Carnegie, Carnegie Hall. I'm just wondering, it was just such a kind of joy to see those those moments. Can you talk about that, this movement between the onstage and offstage? That set was modeled after the actual Carnegie Hall artist studios that were kind of on the top floors of Carnegie Hall that housed musicians and the artists. And, and um, we modeled it after sort of the slope of the skylights that exist now. And, um, and But it was very complex because of that camera move a single shot. So we went through many, many incarnations and fine-tuned the angle of the ceilings, which pieces are going to fly, the elaborate crane shot so that we could do it practically, go out in the hallway and actually into the top tier box of Carnegie Hall. Um, it was pretty much what Bradley conceived on one of our first meetings together. And it went through many incarnations, but I think he got the product that he originally had in his head. Um, Steve, a uh, movie in which music plays such a role as this, it, obviously it has to sound extraordinary, and it does. Um, and you're no stranger to mixing sound on musical films with La La Land, and uh, you work with Bradley on The Star is Born. Um, and with that collaboration, already having, having had a relationship with him already, but what were some of the fresh challenges and the goals sound-wise on, on a movie like this? Yeah, I mean, him and I have a, a understanding that, you know, if there's something on camera that's being played or being sung, he wants that to be live. And that way the, the audience can be much more, you know, um, connected with the, the material versus us trying to fake it. And just so, you know, the goal was always, you know, we're going to do this movie about Leonard Bernstein and he's going to conduct and we're going to have orchestras and we're going to have choirs and we want to do that live. And the, the technical challenge is to make sure that we can record it in a way that nobody's used to hearing it. You know, you, you, we're all used to hearing, you know, classical music on the radio or, you know, even in, in, in movies. But, it, you know, the way that you can get the audience in the middle of an orchestra uh, to feel that, the feeling that he must have felt or that the, the players must have felt to be in the middle of an orchestra, that was always the goal to just be a, as 
authentic and as immersive as possible. And so that was a lot of discussion for, for years on what was going to be live, what wasn't. And it turned out pretty much anything that's on camera being played is live. Um, so yeah, I mean, a little bit of sleep lo lost on that, but you know, we were able to figure it out. Yeah. And then also just, sorry, and then to continue the, the conversational pieces, it was always important to him that you know, conversations and the, the arguments or the, the dialogue always felt natural, like, you know, people would just talk over each other sometimes, and, that, and that's okay, you know, and so it, it was always a careful dance of what, you know, what his desire was and what he wanted to hear, you know, some of the big party scenes, all the extras were talking, everybody was talking, and you're able to do that in a technical way if you know in advance that's what's, that's what we're going to go through, and so um, him and I had many discussions about that and just having it feel real, feel authentic, and have the actors talk over the, the party scenes, and that's why it feels that way, because it was that way. Unique, uh, on this film you essentially trained Bradley to, in the art of conducting a, a crash course, as it were. Um, what, I just have to imagine there are common assumptions, misunderstandings about what a conductor does and how they do it that you wanted to correct or perhaps, you know, and just tell us about what the experience was like um, training about I mean, this. conducting to begin with is a very, very mysterious craft. I mean, I don't know that us conductors know exactly what we're doing anyway. Um, no, we know what we're doing. What I mean is that we don't know exactly which gestures we're doing because the thing is that there are common things that every conductor learns that I could probably teach this entire room in about five minutes. And it mostly has to do with the right hand and which holds the on. But nevertheless, this is international to every conductor. But the rest of it is all different because we have to embody the music. So bring Leonard Bernstein, one of the most documented figure of classical music and of conducting. And I would say probably the most influential conductor I mean, influential musician by far, but also conductor, um, because he was a trailblazer at not being afraid of showing emotion on the podium. Uh, before him, I mean, I'm not saying people would not do this, but there was a, a lot of this kind of traffic cup um, <laughs> thing, you know, you just stay there and you make sure that everyone's together. For Bernstein, it was all about living the music with everything in his body. And I think that Bradley, because he's a fabulous actor, and because, as it's been mentioned now uh, seven times, uh, his research is incredible and relentless and fantastic and so detailed and deep. Um, he came to me knowing the mimics, knowing, you know, the shoulders, and knowing all of that. But how do you make it believable so that he can conduct the London Symphony Orchestra and Chorus in Mahler's Second Symphony, which is notoriously one of the most difficult moments for a professional conductor, let alone someone who's not a conductor. So my goal was to actually not, we didn't start from scratch saying, oh, let's have a course in how conducting goes. It was more to take where he was and then give him some technical assurance whilst leaving him free to be Leonard Bernstein as an actor, which is an emotional example, if I were to describe it. Because that would have been such a mistake in that movie if you portray Bernstein uh, as a conductor and it looks like a school band, something, you know, and nothing, no offense to school band conductors, we need those, but I mean, it's not exactly who Lenny was. <laughs> so, um, we found ways for being in preparation and also on locations to let him be free to express while still really be able to do one, two, three, four at the right place. Because it does indeed drive us crazy, classical musicians, when we see a conductor that's like one, two, one, two. No, it's the other way around, buddy. So, I mean, um, that was important. That's very basic, what I just said, but that's... Uh, there was a lot of time where you were telling the crew that they were doing it wrong because we would all be. <laughs> that's wrong, buddy. 
Well, speaking of, I have to ask really quickly about young conductors. I mean, I love the scene at the end where he is uh, teaching his student, and it's basically you teaching Bradley, teaching uh, as Bernstein teaching this younger uh, <coughs> conducting student, and who has to be good but a little bit off. I mean, what was? Yeah. It? Can you talk about just the putting that scene together? Well, I'm glad you bring this up because also as conducting consultant, my work was especially with Bradley, and it was with Bradley in every scene. But of course, I did have to coach also. This fabulous actor, Jordan Dobson, who was playing William, who's actually an actor, also not a conductor. And then you get to have this, like you just said, and I'm glad you said, yeah, it has to be believable that this person is talented, but not quite. So there were some ways to do that. And um, not to reveal too many secrets, but actually that scene was the first we shot together. You know? That very, very first day for me on set, but was it even yeah, the, it was first, the first day for all? First day of all, right? So that was that at Tanglewood. It exists in a different, slightly different form. It is documented, that scene in Beethoven 8th Symphony, coming from Schleswig-Holstein in Germany, which was another place where Eleni taught a lot of young musicians. And um, that was already, he captured by then all of, and this is after the longest with Kazu also, you know, you know the five hours for, because it was at its oldest. So we had to uh, talk about all the aspects at once, uh, the teaching of how effortlessly at that moment Lenny could take and just show this like upbeat that he wanted the young conductor to do. But like an older conductor sees it, they don't have to do a lot and everybody understands. And then you get the other young conductor who's tripping over the, the, the music stand, because when we're young, we want to do it all at once. I still want to do this, even though I'm not that young. But, uh, so um, yeah, that was a fascinating thing. And I'm so glad that this scene is there, because Lenny, the teacher, is also maybe what makes one of the things that makes, to this day, Leonard Bernstein such an important figure in music. Um, I think now, at this time, we have time for a few questions um, from our press audience. Uh, I'll, uh, starting, uh, I guess, down here with you. The mics are coming around. Or, uh, yes. It's coming, it's right coming. Um, I have a question for Mark Bridges. Yes. Um, about the costumes for Felicia. They are so nuanced and beautiful, and at the same time, they're often the first signifiers of the decade we are in. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, you said they're tied to the decade that... They signify the decade, Absolutely. the first thing that we see. It, it was yeah. very important to me to, to keep the audience in tune with the passage of time. And when we're telling the story, you know, we need to understand that they meet in the 40s and they are still in love and connected during the 50s when he runs backstage and he needs his touchstone during a break in, in conducting. And then when we go to the 70s, I think you're understanding that developments are happening in the relationship as well as fashion, fashion's changing and the people are, are changing within themselves as well. So hopefully you see a color palette change, you see a hem length change, and that uh, helps the story move along and, and connects the audience with that passage of time. Another question? Uh, yeah, right next to it. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, congratulations on this exciting article. I think my question will be more directed to the singer. Uh, something that struck me on the movie, something that struck me too about time for what the spontaneity, the uh, out of spontaneity is everything. So I want to know more about how the script there's room for creating these moments of the spontaneity, or there's room for improvisation, and how you work with that around those moments. So, you know, what's. Right, so I think you're asking about the, the there's a lot of spontaneity uh, and it feels like a, a good bit of improvisation. And so how do you how, how do you uh, uh, come at that? And that's where you know uh, I think Bradley can be able to better answer that once you know uh, you know God willing we have a, a settlement with SAG uh, and they get what they deserve. 
Um, but for the meantime, what I'll just put forth is, you know, Bradley and I workshop the script a ton. Uh, one of the things we did all the time was read back and forth, uh, which I had never done before, which was extraordinary because, you know, you, you, get, you hear things that you don't, you don't feel the same when you're just sitting and trying to reread your computer. Um, and that process was just incredible. Um, and we refined and refined and honed and honed and then we had you know, larger read-throughs uh, with friends of Bradley. Um, but at the end of the day, what you're building with a script <coughs> is a foundation. I believe that certainly in a movie like this, the script is a blueprint, right? And you have to have freedom on the day, right? And what's wonderful when you're working with your director, who's also your lead actor, is that he was as deep deeper than I was into the character and understanding the character and the dynamics and as has been discussed, that marriage and that that, that is our center point of, of that marriage and I believe he brought Carrie in with him so that they both knew those, they knew and I, I think Jamie you could speak to this even better, they both knew Lenny and Felicia so well that they were able to improvise on the day often, you know, using the script as a foundation but then going into something that would feel even more natural. And for me, my favorite scenes in the piece are not the ones that are purely scripted, but the, are the ones where there's a real balance between what was written on the page and then that natural, organic improvisation that makes it feel spontaneous. Do we have time for another question? Uh, over here. My question would be for Jamie. I wanted to know what it was like seeing the final film. And if there was anything that was like heartwarming to see or challenging to watch. And what did you think of Maya's portrait? Where are you? I can't even see where you are. Oh, hi. What was it like to see the final version of the film? Yeah, what was challenging to see or heartwarming to see? Oh, well, uh, Bradley was so generous about including my brother and sister and me on his own journey with this film, which was something he didn't have to do necessarily. He could have just gone off once he had the license, once, once we gave him permission to make the film, he could have just gone off and done that and never consulted with us again had he wanted to. But instead, he uh, made us part of his own journey. And so we saw so much being developed. He sent us pictures on his phone and he showed us some dailies and some little assemblies of footage and so we were really watching the film coming together and saw several iterations of what was close to the final version of the film. <coughs> so for us it's been an enormous journey as well and last night seeing it in Geffen Hall, you know, the very hall where we watched our dad conduct hundreds of times as we were growing up, was, was so gratifying and such an almost mystical circularity for our lives that we shared with the three of us together and with our parents. And seeing the final version on that giant screen with the incredible Dolby Atmos sound was uh, just overwhelmingly thrilling and and also very surreal of course all the way along it's been surreal to see these two people becoming more and more and more like our own parents uh, but at different ages and sometimes they're older than we are now and sometimes they're way younger and sometimes we were the kids, and it's, it's just, you can imagine. It's like having a very strange dream, where you're in your house, but it's sort of not your house, and, and you're with your parents, but they're, they're, they're sort of not your parents, but they are. Like, so it, it has that dream-like quality for us, but what a ride. I think that is a beautiful note to end on, and thank you all. And thank you.